I've been doing journalism since I was 15 years old and an intern at uh, the black community newspaper in my town. And uh, I have lived through a lot of cycles of uh, news that felt like the end of the world and a lot of cycles of the news that felt like great change and a lot of times where it felt like our work was essential and a lot of times where it felt like our work was useless. Uh, and booms and busts and all the rest, and I've kind of lost the thread of the future myself. So I am thrilled that we have three people here who are very clear about the future um, and are actively making the future of our industry. Um, so Jin Ding is an alumna of the executive program in news innovation and leadership at the Craig Newmark School of Graduate School of Journalism and the CEO of Initia Media Now. Latoya Francis is currently a graduate student at Columbia University School of Journalism. And Lawrence Okenye is a labor and employment reporter at Politico uh, and a graduate of Temple University. And uh, we are going to talk about the future that they are making together. So let's start with you, Jen. Um, when you left journalism school, you also decided to leave English language media um, and that was a very big moment for you. Can you tell me about that choice and like why it excited you? I finished my uh, CUNY executive program um, last year. And at a time, um, I've been in um, the US as an immigrant for 12 years. And um, I basically means the entire 12 years I haven't been working as a field journalist and not in my native language. Um, for so long, I feel that is, was a moment I really realized how China and my community, Chinese Americans, have been changing um, because of everything that's happening, you know, with COVID and as well as what happened in China politically. Um, we're witnessing a really, really big wave of journalism um, pipeline dying in the entire language. And this is a language that is being used one out of five people on this planet. And back then, 12 years ago when I left to China, there are thousands of newsrooms exist and there are infrastructures to support journalists to, to become you know, feature journal journalism writers, um, to do investigative work, uh, even though there isn't you know, a full press freedom, but there are ways to pursue this career. Um, right now, we are seeing majority of those newsrooms gone completely wiped out. There is you know, no pipeline. Thousands, if not tens of thousands, journalists have left the field. Many of them are um, leaving China right now and becoming Uber drivers in Canada and you know, um, grocery workers in UK. I really felt the urgency that I need to do something about it. How can I actually keep journalism alive in this language? Um, that's the moment I really decided, you know, as at the time I was the only um, Chinese uh, citizen who have made executive rank in U.S. media. And I decided this is the time that I need to return to my Chinese journalism community, figure out how can we keep this language in journalism alive outside of the home, outside of China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and being really able to serve the community here. And I'd never really felt being served here with journalism. I speak Chinese and English. I read English journalism every single day. But they don't talk about my community in the way seeing us as part of the story. So this was your provocation into what you're doing now. And Latoya, you are still in graduate school. Um, what, what ex which I think, believe, when you went to Columbia, it was your first step into journalism. Uh, what excited you about this work? What made you want to do this? Well, my my name tag should actually say alum now because I graduated on Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so coming to or going to Columbia Journalism School for graduate school was my first step into journalism formally. Um, what excited me about it? I mean... <laughs> I feel like my generation, I'm 24. I feel like the generation that I'm a part of, we've just, I've seen countless emails with the words unprecedented times 
from like university <laughs> administrators. I went to Cornell for undergrad and I'm sure you guys have all seen what has been going on on Columbia's campus. Um, it has been a remarkable year to be a journalism student on Columbia's campus. I was also the president of our like student government or the Society of Professional Journalists, so that chapter at Columbia's campus. And coming into the program, I didn't know to expect any of that. I don't think anyone would have, um, but I was excited to be a part of telling the narrative. Um, there's this quote that has really stuck with me when I read Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, where he said, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And that's something that has always stuck with me. I just feel like for myself, I'm a young black woman. I'm from Canarsie, Brooklyn. Um, I'm the daughter of immigrants. My family is Jamaican. I just always feel like there's no better time than the present to be a part of telling this story. And going to Columbia, I was like, well, there's no shortage of stories to tell here. Um, being from New York City, I was born and raised in Brooklyn. I just, I don't know, I just always feel like there's a calling um, to be a part of telling the story, because if not me, then who? Um, I don't know, hopefully that answers the question. And my first time being published was during my time at Columbia Journalism School. Um, I worked on a project with my friend and partner, Sophia, um, and it was about Pop Smoke. I don't know if anybody has heard of Pop Smoke, but he is a rap he is a late rapper um, from Canarsie, Brooklyn, my same neighborhood. We have mutual friends. Um, and he died at the age of 20 after only a 14 month long career as a rapper. Um, and that's not a very uncommon story. I think we've all heard of a headline, like insert rapper here, dead at insert young age here. And often due to gun violence, which is how he died. Um, and I just wanted to do a spotlight because we were coming up on the fourth anniversary of his passing. So we actually had the, inter the opportunity to interview his mom, a lot of his close friends, and just tell a really like nuanced narrative about what happens to a community when a young legend dies. A lot of times in hip hop culture, it's like rappers really rep where they come from. And there was this huge spotlight on Canarsie while he was coming up and then he's just taken from us so soon. And it's like, what happens to that community? What happens to all the young people who found hope in him? Um, so yeah, I had the opportunity to tell that story and I feel like that was really telling, that I was able to tell a story that felt true to myself, that was about a rapper that didn't feel Columbia Journalism School-esque. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm from Canarsie, Brooklyn. I told a story about a young man who died too soon and who was a rapper and who contributed to hip hop culture and who contributed to what my generation has been looking up to and it's, is inspired by. And I think that was really meaningful to me and really telling for why I went to this school in the first place. Dare I say, Latoya, Columbia Journalism School is you, and so whatever story you're telling is what it is. Uh, Lawrence, in your first couple of years in journalism, you have covered a lot of ground. Um, you have been uh, in the belly of the beast in D.C., um, come, you know, working in the White House and Congress, uh, but you also, before that, did much more local news you can use uh, kind of work. And I just wonder about those two paths. Um, and as you've gotten started, what you think about those two and what, how, 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 how they each excite you differently? Definitely. So yeah, I currently am a labor and employment reporter at Politico. Um, it's been crazy because I started there as an intern summer 2022. So I was there um, covering national security, um, then I moved on to their fellowship program where I was at the White House for a few months. Then I moved on to the Hill and then I did campaigns. Um, and, you know, sort of like Kai said, it's very different than sort of the journalism world I came up in. Um, I was the editor in chief of my college newspaper at Temple University. And one thing I really love about Temple is they instill sort of a pride in like local journalism and local reporting. And that's something I take with me every day. Um, I'm a big believer in impact, how the stories and the work I produce sort of like move the ball forward for somebody or some movement. And I think we did that at Temple. Um, I think um, I went to college at a very interesting time for a lot of people my age group. Um, when I think about the racial unrest um, in 2020, the COVID pandemic, um, it was a lot of, you know, how can people get vaccinated? How can people 
get, you know, COVID tests? How can people, you know, know who to vote for, or like where to vote? You know, how can people sort of access the nuts and bolts things that are important in their lives? Um, and then I sort of like contrast with that with the work I do in DC that's very, you know, 30,000 feet, um, you know, regulation, you know, different policies from the administration. It's a lot for a young person to unpack, especially when you come into an industry where you're taught to have impact and, you know, make a difference in people's lives. So um, that's something I carry with me every day. I like to think that, you know, here or in Washington, the work that I do does move the ball forward for some person. Um, I cover labor. So, you know, obviously this is a big year for unions, um, union endorsements. Um, obviously, last summer there was, you know, a big, you know, push with the UAW um, and their push to sort of like um, with their strike and like auto workers and whatnot. Um, so that's something I sort of think about every day, impact. Um, and I think, you know, for all of us here on the panel, um, in our day-to-day -day lives, when we think about the work that we do, um, it doesn't matter whether you're covering, you know, local journalism or national journalism, um, thinking about sort of like the things that you cover and how they move the ball forward for somebody. We're going to have uh, the last 10 minutes or so of our conversation is going to be questions from you. So get your, uh, get your, your questions ready. You'll just raise your hand when I ask and someone will come around with a mic. So just, you know, be ready to, to chip in. Uh, Latoya, let me ask you, you mentioned um, that uh, the obvious in our previous conversation that this is a weird time to be entering journalism. Uh, the, for many of us, the, the water cooler conversation is all about layoffs and uh, career changes and less resources. Um, and I just wonder from your perspective, a, what it's like to hear all that, and B, where you find uh, the enthusiasm that the rest of us need to hear. That's a great question. Um, honestly, I, as I mentioned before, I was present at the J School, and one thing that I kind of spoke up a lot about was, I was like, I don't like the poor journalist joke, <laughs> because I don't want to be that. Um, we had a class called like the business of journalism, essentially, um, where our professor, Allison Overholt, she, um, she kind of just stressed the importance of being able to advocate for yourself and like knowing the business behind the journalism that a lot of times there's this big like, the way we referred to it in class was the separation of church and state of like there's the business side of the newsroom and then there's the people who write and create the news. Um, and she basically pushed us to make sure that we are always thinking with a business mind and like make sure that we make connections with the people across the newsroom so that we're never in the dark about all of that. Um, so I think first answer to your question is just educating myself, making sure that I'm kind of equipped with the knowledge that I need to enter the space and make sure that I know how to advocate for myself and ask the right questions. Um, and then on top of that, I, I think I've always been very like, I feel like I've always had the mind of an entrepreneur. Um, my, if I close my eyes and envision where I see myself in a few years, like I, I don't know, my dream has never been to climb the corporate ladder, if that makes sense. Like I, I don't know that I, um, strongly ascribed to any one newsroom. Like, I know that there were a lot of my peers in the program who were like, oh, it's New York Times or bust. Like, <laughs> and I, I, <laughs> I really value um, those spaces for sure. And I think that there's a lot to be learned, a lot of uh, knowledge to be absorbed. Um, but I really want to create my own space. Um, I am really big on community. I think that there's a lot of stories to be told. I think access is really important. Language is really important in how we tell stories. Who can access the stories that we're telling? Um, don't want to just pop into a community, tell their story, and then publish it, and then no one ever reads it because there's a paywall that they need to get past in order to read the story about them. Um, and that's honestly something that I experienced when I published in Rolling Stone about my community back in Canarsie. Um, so Hopefully that answers your question. I think I'm enthusiastic because I know that the possibilities are kind of endless. And I know that if there isn't something there already, then I'll just 
create it. I know that's easier said than done. Um, and I think coming from the background that I come from, money is always a concern for sure. Um, and that's just me being candid about that. Like I would love to start my own podcast this summer, um, but I'm thinking about access to equipment <laughs> that I no longer have hey, from so J school. Radio or bus. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So. Thinking about the future of independent media, um, you know, which is a, a challenging space, um, what do you see as the biggest opportunities and challenges over the next couple of years? Well, um, I well, initially I'm missing a very difficult, difficult and different spot with majority of the English media. I, I complained a lot when I was worked in English, but I'm not complaining now with my new job. Um, I, I have the most privileged and probably the best job in Chinese journalism right now, out of you know tens of thousands of trained journalists in China and uh, outside. Um, I feel like the the future for us is to be able to create competitors in this language. Um, I hope in addition to become the field that can support, the, uh, a publication that can support like, you know, more people in this field, but at the same time, I know we can't do it alone. And uh, to be honest, we would benefit from more competitors. We right now are the only independent um, media outside of China covering China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and diaspora audience with general news. Um, in simplified Chinese. We also publish in traditional Chinese, but there are more competitors in traditional Chinese. We're the only one doing that kind of work in simplified Chinese. We need more newsrooms. And I, to be honest, right now, very hard to hire people because there is no other newsroom to hire from. Um, I need to create the entire audience team from scratch, create the entire product team from scratch. Um, I need competitors. That's my dream. And I hope we will be able to create more, my, my newsroom can create director of audience for other newsrooms in the future. All right, so start raising your hands uh, as we, we move to your, your section of the program, uh, and people will come around with a microphone. Lawrence, um, you, you have mentioned that uh, you are, when you think about the future, you are really invested in um, making sure that the diverse group of people have the kind of opportunities that you have had. Uh, how do you think about, you know, again, both the challenges and opportunities of that when you think about the, the field you know, five years from now? Definitely. So I'm very blessed to live in the Washington, D.C. area. So all those internships that I've had, whether it was Politico, The Daily Beast, um, they were very much within striking distance for me. And even I remember during my sophomore year, um, I was even able to take an unpaid internship, which a lot of people can't and, you know, oftentimes shouldn't do depending on their situation. Um, and I think when I think about diversity, I think about, you know, obviously there's a word of mouth component. There's obviously, you know, companies that have to institute like structures to like get more people in the building. Um, but I think it all comes down to sort of, you know, the stuff that happens at the college level and just sort of like making sure it stays at the forefront. Um, I know that it, you know, as a labor reporter, like DEI is becoming like a very like interesting word, you know, <laughs> like a lot of people, you know, that's, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's really strange, um, hearing, you know, the way like that term has like changed over the past, um, like year or so. And I think, you know, it's all about, you know, improving pathways for people. I know personally, as someone who works in Politico, I, you know, am like taking it upon myself to like go to the conferences, like hand out my business card to people, think about, you know, maybe like showing them around our newsroom and thinking about, you know, what can I, you know, tell you about your resume, your cover letter, like the previous experiences that you've had and how they sort of, you know, could, you know, fit a program that you might want to participate in going forward. So um, I definitely think, you know, from where I was when I started in 2022 at Politico to now, I think we've gotten more people in, in the door. But um, I definitely want to think about, you know, what I can do and not just for Politico, but just Washington journalism in general, how we can bring more diverse faces into the fold. Okay, friends, who's got a question for these brilliant, these brilliant folks right here? Uh, hi, I'm Heather Grady with Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. Jin, my question's for you. Um, first, can you employ people in China as journalists or is it just people based here? 
We talk a lot about differences in audiences by age in the United States. Um, how does it look for Chinese Americans in terms of what they're interested in or how they consume their news? Thanks. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, no, we don't have full-time employees in China um, for safety reasons. For our audience, the Initium's audience is quite young, very opposite with the uh, traditional Chinese um, publications in the U.S. Um, for their, our audience are not the ones, uh, you know, grandma and grandpas will pick up uh, Xingdao Daily at the grocery store. Um, we, um, it's 10 years younger than me and 10 years older than me, 25 to 45, that's our main audience. Um, I think that's actually great for us because we, everybody's trying to reach Gen Z, we have Gen Z. Um, and um, that's through, you know, a lot of a very, um, we're digital native, and we are also uh, very um, interested in, you know, we have a very good gaming column, for example, and those are the things that we try to um, bridge um, the divide in that information space. And it actually allows us to, to, you know, reach more people because the uh, digital nativeness in, in our uh, publication at the same time, um, to be honest, you know, no one become a feature editor in English when you're 28 years old. But unfortunately, that's what's happening in Chinese right now. Um, our editors are, are my generation as well because, you know, we don't have the pipeline. Um, that helps them to speak the language of the young people as well. Hi, everyone. This one is for the whole panel. Um, I'm Samil with Independence Public Media Foundation. And we fund a lot of uh, local news initiatives, hyper-local um, news ecosystems. And I'm curious from your perspectives, um, what are some actual out-of-the-box uh, journalism with a little J, not like the big institutions of journalism, like wh what, what are you getting inspired by, excited by, that um, might be great for us to know about? Okay, journalism out of the box, and we're gonna we're gonna go down the line, and I'm gonna ask you to do it in you know 90 seconds each. Oh, yeah. Um, one thing I'm pretty inspired by is like all the work that's going on on college campuses right now, because that stuff is very hyper local and oftentimes doesn't get like enough funding. Um, specifically with the protests around Gaza, a lot of these students like missing classes, like not getting sleep. Um, all to keep people informed about an issue that's like very important and might have like actual like like election implications. And um, you know, when we talk about people like putting their safety at risk, all to just keep people informed, I think that's it, it really gives me hope about what the future might hold for people who are stepping into our industry. Um, I definitely agree with Lawrence. I would I think especially on Columbia's campus and being in the journalism program, like seeing my peers just kind of rise to the occasion um, and just really jump in and tell the story that kind of combat the narrative that was being put out um, by journalists off campus um, was really important and also really inspiring. And um, our, our dean at the J School actually joked that that was like a simulation that the J School created to assess our skills, um, kind of like a big final project. <laughs> but um, yeah, very, I think that was very inspiring for sure. Um, and I would say outside of that, just like seeing the rise of podcasting and just like YouTube, just just how social media is being used to share information and how much trust a lot of young people especially have in those platforms. Through J School, we did a service project at a um, public school in Harlem and we asked young people like, where do you get your news from? And it was like Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and I think that that's something that's really important and really like we gotta focus in on because they're not watching the news and they're not reading. <laughs> so I think that's something that's also really important to hone in on and see how we can leverage that for sure. Right, but I, know, I know I said 90 seconds, but I wanna follow up on that because so, so much of the conversation about digital media, social media is terror of it. Um, that, oh no, this is where young people are getting their news. And you're telling us be excited about that. Make that case. Help people understand why you think we should be excited about it. 
access is important. <laughs> like the the idea that somebody's going to go pick up a newspaper or going to subscribe to a certain publication in order to read their news on a regular basis is like I think we need to be aware of the fact that that is changing. And if somebody can get on their phone and like the first thing they do in the morning is go on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, then we need to be intentional about how we share information on those platforms or else it's going to be a very missed opportunity. That's just what I think. <laughs> um, I'm super excited about all the community engagement um, ideas that we now have in journalism. Um, listen to what your readers want to read about and ask them for, you know, what, what are you interested in? Um, and tell us where you get your news, for example, and also um, trying to meet their needs. Um, we did a focus group actually last weekend um, to focus on American audience. Um, so America now is the, the largest uh, um, audience group outside of Hong Kong, mainland China, and Taiwan for us. Um, so we asked them, you know, we always covered America like a correspondent. This is not our country. We're, we're here just to visit. Um, but now we are immigrating with the, our audience as well. Um, we also run a column written by Hong Kongers who left Hong Kong after 2020. And um, they share their life with us and with all the readers. And they talk about what kind of food they're cooking from you know, Costco. Uh, they buy things in Canada and they figure out how to cook Chinese food and they, they how to make Chinese food in Birmingham, a UK. And they share their life about how they participate in democracy in different parts of the world with each other. And I think that is so exciting because we're not the one directing that show. It actually is our audience are telling their own story through our platform. We, we are able to, um, we were founded on the idea that we will be able to bridge the gap between Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland Chinese um, in news and ideology. Our comment section shows they are talking on this platform civilized. You know, look at all the YouTube comments, you know what's, what's, what I mean. Like, it's very political. Um, but they're not arguing because they, they read about each other and then they understand, oh, actually, I'm an immigrant in the US as a mainland Chinese and I feel exactly the same as this Hong Kong person immigrated to UK. I think that's, that's the part I feel really engaging and I, I, I believe this is a way we can keep our publication alive. Can we thank Jin Ding, Latoya Francis, and Lawrence Ukinye for their wonderful insights.